Boker to everybody again. Shavua Tov. Okay, we're going to compare Sefer Tvarim to Malchion and Zichronon, I believe. Okay, and Bakasha uh, Rabbi Liptag. Okay, thank you. So I have the honor of giving the last share of the year, correct, Rabbi Jay? No. There's another one today? <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, you do. I, I, my mistake. We haven't necessarily to make you, but yes, you have the honor of giving the last year. My mistake. Akron, Akron, Khabib. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that uh, you have to pay us a bonus for the right to give the last year of the year. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I figured I had to pick a topic related to Rosh Hashanah. The problem is in Sefer Devarim, it doesn't talk about Rosh Hashanah. So, of course, the goal of the year today shows that, of course, it does talk about Rosh Hashanah. Sort of. <laughs> um, so the title today, let me share my screen. Today's share is number 14. Here we go. Um, and re examining concepts of Machiot and Zichronot uh, in light of our study of Sefer Devarim. Okay. So last week we talked about chapters 29 and 30, Brit Nitzavim. We talked about it was the Brit about the Brit, and we talked about how uh, the Brit between God and his people was an eternal Brit. We can't break out and God can't break out. And that eternal understanding of I'm, he's our God and we're his people, uh, we relate to that the themes of Machiot in our Rosh Hashanah davening and our daily prayers. But that core concept that we're God's people, we're chosen to serve him, and God's covenant is eternal. God doesn't promise it will work forever, but it always has the potential that it could work, but it's a two-way street. And he expects us to do our best, and he always gives us an opportunity to return. So that was the um, theme of Britain Sabim we talked about. So in today's class, we're going to discuss the connection of, of that idea, of that idea of Brit, also to the concept of Zichronot and Shofrot, and we're basically talk about Tefillah in general, and later the themes, primarily reward and punishment, we'll see why. I want to show you how reward and punishment, which is a big theme in Sefer Dvarim, Parshat Ekev, the Tochachan, Kitavo, Shira Tazino coming up, uh, there's warnings also against punishment in Brit Nitzavim we saw before, um, Parshat Shema, Vayim Shema, almost everywhere you turn, there's a lot of reward and punishment that's highlighted all through the book. And we have to see how that relates to Tefillah in general, especially on the theme of Malchiot and Zichronot and Shofrot, we'll see in on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so here's my opening question, just to call the trigger. Um, if someone wants to add something real quick, you know, just think about it for a minute. Would you consider Shofar blowing his Tefillah? Understand my question? So it's blowing the shofar is, you know, we, it's a chiv to blow the shofar. It, would it in any way have the same framework as tefillah? Just for the fun of it, I'll take a minute and see if anyone wants to say something. I see Ruth wants to write something. Here's the chat. Let's see. Uh, oh, a call to tefillah. Okay. But it, it stops that prayer. Okay. Nonverbal prayer, like I'm going to go in that direction, sort of. And Is it a tchina? Okay. Now, um, what I want to show you today, the reason I asked the question, not only could shofar be considered tefillah, I want to show you that according to Ramban, Rachmanides, um, it could be, uh, we'll talk about hearing is tefillah, okay, we'll talk about, we'll see the word hearing is bishmo, that will, that'll be a big point in today's share. Um, I want to show you that not only can you consider shofar as similar to tefillah, but rather, it could be that we learn tefillah from the laws of shofar. But it's going to redefine not only what shofar means, or redefine what tefillah means. That's what I want to show you today. The connection between the commandment to blow shofar and our commandment, our obligation to pray. Okay, which goes to my next question, is there a biblical obligation to pray? I'm sure everyone knows the answer. Anyone who went to yeshiva, you know, give me, you can say Rabbi. Rabbi Jay has to leave in the middle today, right, Rabbi Jay? Going to the airport, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's the classic yeshiva answer? Is there, is there a biblical obligation to pray? Spoke about it last night, of course. The machlok okay. at the, Ram, the Ramban. Ramban is, and uh, Rambam, right? Yeah, famous. Okay. And what's the famous here? Yeah, Rambam holds. My Maimonides holds what? That prayer is um, every day, and the Ramban okay. holds only in an eight sarah, or tefillah is an act of chesed. That's what I spoke about yesterday in Shorosh. And of course, the Rav Soloveitchik's famous idea that um, the Rambam and the Rambam both agree that tefillah emanates from a sense of need. Just the Rambam says, even if you don't realize you have needs, every yeah, day, every day. No, it's only arguing whether you realize you're in trouble. You're always in trouble. It's always a it's question when you realize it. Exactly. All right, you asked me, so I had to answer. Yeah. But, no, okay. uh, yeah, so so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and show where that's coming from today, from within Chamesh, the biblical roots of uh, 
of that idea. And a third question, which we want to consider today, um, why don't we judge once a year and not every day? Of course, the Gemara talks about that, right? We're judged once a year, but we are judged once a day. So what's the difference between our being judged basically every day, on the other hand, being judged once a year? Um, okay, now, I want to bring a proof about tefillah from the blessing we make for Shofarot. Remember, the, the, the last blessing, and, and uh, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I didn't hear Rabbeni's shiris, but I'm sure Rabbeni's giving a shir on, on Rosh Hashanah. I'm sure he's talking about the structure of all the Malchiot uh, and Shofarot. And the Tempsu came and the introductions and the and the Khatima, but the Khatima, the closing blessing for Shofrot. I'll just read it quickly. You know, we said we um, we want God to build a shofar for our freedom, you know, bring us back from uh, Kibbutz Galuyot, etc. I'm not gonna talk about that. I think Benny did. And then you know, we're hoping we can return and we can bring our return to the temple service. What Pasik do we quote at the end? The very last verse that we quote in Musaf. It's the end of Shofrot, but I want to show you this verse, which has a lot to do with Shofar blowing and Tefillah, we'll see. The final verse we quote from Sefer Bamidbar has in it, Malchiot Zichonot and Shofrot. Let's read. Uvyom simchatchem v'molechem. On your happy days and on your holidays. On the days of gathering at Smodim from Parshat Emor in Sefer Vayikra. Uvrashei chot shechem. That's from um, the holidays in Parshat Pinchas. What are we commanded to do on the holidays? These happen to be the same times that we bring Korban Musaf. Utkatem b'chatzotrot. We blow the shofar, with the shofar, on our sacrifices. Okay? And there will be remembrance in front of God. So, shofrot clearly is katem b'chatzotrot. That's shofrot. That should be obvious. And as Chazal say, Ani Hashem Elokechem, that was last week's shir. Remember Liot Lachad Elohim? That's Malchiyot. Remember my proof? Remember Liot Lachad Elohim? I'm your God, you're my people. That was last week's shir. That was the core covenant. That's Brit Chorev, um, which is the essence of Malchiyot, because it's not understanding that God exists, but our understanding that we're chosen to serve him. And, but our goal is universal, even though our being chosen is particular. That's why Chazal picked this Pasuk for the grand finale, it's not just a finale for Shofrot, it's also a finale for all three. Okay? This is someone mentioned before about God hearing. God hears, like, remember, we in regular day we have a bracha Shomea Tfilah, bracha Tam Shomea Tfilah. Here, Shomea Kol Shofar, Mazin Tura, Bein Domelach, bracha Tashem, Shomea Kol Tura Tamoisa, bracha Mim. He hears. So if God's Shomea Tfilah, he's also Shomea Tura. What does that mean? So, um, I want to give a proof that uh, the idea of, of hearing shofar is important. Why? What bracha do we make on shofar? This is a classic, you know, halacha class and gemara class. I'm sure everyone talks about it. But what's the blessing? Asher kedishon mitzvah lishma kol shofar. The baltokea, the the person blowing the shofar, doesn't make the blessing litko shofar or atkiat shofar, does he? He makes the bracha lishma kol shofar. In other words, it's more important to hear it than to blow it. The main thing is to hear the, the, the shofar blowing. So what's this idea of hearing shofar blowing and how does it affect anything? So um, what do you mean to hear the shofar? I'm going to give a little um, insight here. In general, when it, when it comes to communication, how do you communicate ideas? And when we talk about tefillah, how do we communicate with HaKadosh Baruch How do we communicate with God? So the truth is, when we daven, when we say words, when we say things in Hebrew or English, words are simply an expression of feeling, of inner feeling. And when you say things, if you understand them, not just kavana, but havana, not just intention, but also understanding, that's a way of conveying your internal feelings to God. God knows what you feel, but you want to convey it. The question is, is shofar blowing also a type of conveying a certain feeling to God? That's what Chazal talk about, it's like a bechi, a bechi shows shofar, a shofar is like a baby crying. Now, I think Chazal's analogy of a, of a shofar like a baby crying, I think is awesome, from my, it's been a while, but from what I remember, um, a baby knows if the mother is nervous. Yeah. If the mother's nervous, the mother's at, the mother can be in another room. Okay. If the mother's nervous, the baby's crying. I'm not sure. I think it's true. Check with the psychologist. But I, I'm pretty sure that's what they say. In other words, there's an ability for the mother to sense something's wrong with the child and the child to sense without without knowing any language. There's a type of communication between 
between human beings, between parents and children, between friends and in any relationship, sometimes you can transmit feelings without having to say a word. Now, speaking, there's also, you know, to catch the fires uh, compared to remember hearing a chamor, hearing a donkey, making a noise. So um, it's interesting. Now, I'm an example from a donkey. If you ever went donkey riding, I remember the first time I went donkey riding on, you know, this Tulim and Israel and stuff. And it's amazing. When you sit on a donkey and you're afraid, the donkey kicks you off, doesn't listen to a thing. If you get on that donkey and you're sure of yourself and you're secure, he listens to you. That's, that's why, you, remember, Yishayel, Yudea, Shab Perkalaf, right? I say chapter one, Yudea, Shor Koneo, Bacharmo, Abus Baldo. The animals, the ox, or the donkey know who their boss is. There's, there's a way that you communicate your internal feeling even to an animal, Kabachomer, to another human being, even more Kabachomer, Takarish Borchu. So the, the idea that when you blow shofar, you're communicating some type of communication. That's what I want to talk about. I want to give a, not a, um, a philosophical approach. I want to give a shot approach in Chumash. We'll see why. So I want to discuss that. What's it mean to hear shofar? So before we go any farther, I want to go back. I'm sure you've seen this took before, but there's only one source in Chumash for Rosh Hashanah, one commandment, which is the Moadim in Amor, chapter 23 in Sefer Vayikra. And remember all the Moadim in Vayikra, they're all Mikrei Kodesh, all times of gathering. We call it together. They're all called a Shabbaton. They're all called, they're all called, they all have their day of rest. There's a day that we don't do any malacha, we don't do any work, and we bring a special sacrifice. So the phrase is, is for all the holidays. is by all the holidays. In some form or other, they're all called Shabbatonim or Shabbat Shabbatonim. And um, they're all called Mikrei Kodesh. I think that's, oh, here, Mikrei Kodesh, here we go. They're all there. And, and basically, the only thing unique to Yom Kippur is, is what I've highlighted here is Yichron Trua. And if you were reading Chumash for the first time and never heard about this holiday that we call Rosh Hashanah, the only thing Chumash calls it is Yichron Trua, and there's two ways to understand it. You need to remember to blow a Trua, to make, to make the Trua Hashem with this so far, or you blow a Trua to remember. In other words, is the main holiday a time of Zikaron? Is it Yom Zikaron or Yom Trua? How does our sitter paskin? What's the bracha we make? Melech HaKolaras, Mekereshi Yisrael, B'Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaTrua. Now, indeed, in Sefer Bamidbar, it's called Yom Trua. But I want to prove something, really. Let me take a real quick time out. I shouldn't do it, but I want to share with you an idea, uh, understanding um, I thought about a couple years ago. In the holidays in Bamidbar, it doesn't talk about it doesn't define the holiday. When it describes the holiday in Bamidbar, we get the, when we have the Korban Amuksaf, when it describes every holiday, it doesn't explain the reason for a holiday or the purpose of a holiday. It explains what, what we do on the holiday. You see what I mean? In other words, we, we don't have the definition of the holiday. It talks about what we do on the holiday. So let me just stop the share for a minute. I'll share my screen. You can check it out later on. I think it's really interesting. Um, we open up Sefer Bamidbar, where are we? Chapter 28. Just take a quick look. Every holiday, what do we do? Um, let's take, what do we do on Pesach? What's it called? Um, I'm sorry, Chag Matzot. What do we do? We eat matzah for seven days. That's all it says. What do we do? We doesn't say we don't eat chametz. It says we eat matzah for seven days. That's what we do. What do we do on Yom Kippurim? It's when we bring a new mincha to God. It talks about what we do, usually what we do in the temple. Okay? That's, that is, um, that's Shavuot. Let's go to chapter 29. Rosh Hashanah, remember? Um, what's it called here? Yom Tra Yelechem. It's not defining the holiday, it's what we do on the holiday. Yom Kippur, this is, this is the best proof. On the 10th of the month, what do we do? Vinitem et nafshotechem. I'm pretty sure that it's not called Yom Kippurim, is it? Right? It, was, it mentions Chatat Kippurim, but it doesn't say on the seventh, in the seventh month, on the tenth day, you have Yom Kippur. So it's, what do you do? We need them enough shotechem. You afflict your souls. Don't do any work. It doesn't call it Yom It's not defining the holidays. This is what we do on the holiday. And what else do we do? We bring a korban. Okay? We bring you know, the Ola and the Chatat. And again, what's the proof? What we do on Sukkot? Uh, what do we do? We celebrate. 
We don't call it Sukkot. It's not called Sukkot. It's not called Sukkot. Yom Kippur is not called Yom Kippur. And Rosh Hashanah is not called Rosh Hashanah. Yom Nisikaron. It talks about what we do on the holiday. Right? We bring our Bikurim, we eat matzah, etc. So that's what I'm, I'm bringing that on purpose to show that I can't prove from Sefer Bamidbar that, that I could call Rosh Hashanah Yom Tura. It's true, that's what we do on the holiday, but that's not the essence of the holiday. The essence of the holiday is Yom Zikaron, and that's how we paskin in the Siddur. All, all of our liturgy follows that idea that it's a Yom Zikaron, and we have to define what does it mean, Yom Zikaron. Let me check the chat real, real fast. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, first of terms. Okay. Uh, we'll give the link to that. It'll be on the, what, the link to the source sheet will be on the webpage. Um, they usually put that up soon after this year. Okay, let's return to our source sheet. So again, that's back where we were before, but everyone sees that. So we have a commandment in Vayikra to have a Zikron Tura. And again, I suggested two ways that we have to either remember to blow Shofar or we blow Shofar to remember. We're going to follow the latter. We'll see why it makes, thematically it makes so much sense. Now, um, the idea of a Yom Tura though, what the, what's the meaning of Yom Tura? Go ahead. So again, we can bring like 20, 30, maybe, maybe not 20, but at least 10 sources in Tanakh uh, that talk about the idea of Yom Tura. But I want to bring an example. The classic one from Tzvania is describing a terrible day of punishment. Yom Evraha Yom Ahu, a day of wrath. Yom Tzaram Tzuka, that comes up the davening, a day of trouble and distress. Yom Shoah Um Shoah, the word Shoah comes from here. We call that a Holocaust, but it's a day of wasteness and desolation, it says. Yom Choshech Vafela, Yom Anan Varafel. It's really a bad day. Yom Shofar Utra, a day of what? Of Shofar and Trua. Therefore, a day of Trua and blowing Shofar, that's a day, that's an alarm. When al Arim that's when we're at war. Now, the reason for that, and one more example, what I'm going to say, Mitaka Shofar Ba'ir, Ba'amil Chiradu, Chapter three, that's Aftara for Al Shoshap Bishak, probably um, either probably by Ishev. No, no. Um, no, by Ishlach or by Ishev. The Aftara for Mamos. Um, but Al Shoshap Bishak, Babalo Yishuveno, Mikram Bikesab Sadiq, Vivian Babur Nalai. That's Parsha by Ishev, it said. So it says there, Imitaka Shofar Ba'ir, Bam Loi Kharadu. If what? If the watchman blows. If the what that's the Yechesko chapter, what was that? Chapters 33, chapter 33 in Yechesko talks about Nubuat Tatsufet. I didn't want to bring all those, it's, I would take up the whole share, so I'm holding myself back. But what's it mean? In ancient times, they didn't have cell phones, no WhatsApp groups, no alarms, no TV. If you had to communicate and you had to give a message to everybody, you needed to make a loud sound, no PA systems. The best thing was a shofar. So in the temple, we see that chotzatzot, they had bugles made out of metal. But the simplest thing was a shofar from, a, from the horn of, a, of an animal. And every military commander had a shofar. So again, we could give a whole share on the book of Shoftim in chapter six, seven, and eight, the story of Gidon. Remember, Gidon takes 300 men. They, in the middle of the night, they go behind enemy lines. They have three rows of 100 each. Each one has a shofar. In the middle of the night, they build a shofrot, and everyone sees them in the lanterns. 300 shofrot, doesn't sound like 300 soldiers, it sounds like 300 officers in an organized column already inside enemy lines, and therefore everyone in the camp, in the enemy camp, is sure they've been defeated, that the Heathites have come in, and are already in the middle of their camp, and they run away. And that was exactly the strategy that you don't use, but there are 300 shofrot, basically you hear a shofar blowing, that means there's a war going on. And therefore, nowadays, if you hear like lots of sirens going on, you know, that, that means something happened. Now, so therefore, everyone, of course, is going to be scared. It's a cause and effect kind of thing. And, and therefore, the next time we should read, you know, and if the Navi says something, God is behind it, maybe we'll go back and see almost later on, because it's the same idea we're about being of Zikaron. Meaning, when someone hears a shofar blowing in biblical times, it basically means there's a good chance there's a war going on, which means it's a question of life and death. And as they say, there's no fox in a, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Now, um, so if the Torah tells us to have a, a true on that day and to remember something, so that's why Chazal begin to see already here that we're supposed to remember, we blow a true to remember that our lives are on the line. Hence, it's a day of judgment. We're being judged for the year. But we don't know yet why this time of year, 
And why is it they've judged me? Now, now we go to the most important source. Um, okay, the key to understanding Zichron Torah, we have to go now to Bamidbar Perak Yod. I'll go over the first eight psukim just to get the context, but we're going to focus on, on the last two psukim, which is what we quote in our davening. So it's the 10th chapter of Sefer Bamidbar. At the end of chapter 10, we're ready to leave Harsinai. That's Vahibin Salron, Vahim and Moshe. That's when the Mishkan's all ready to go. The camp is organized and we begin our march to Israel. Of course, everything afterwards goes wrong. But that, that's the end. The last good chapter of Sefer Bamidbar is chapter 10. And on the, as they're about to leave, they brought Pesach Rishon, Pesach Sheni, everyone's vaccinated and they're ready to go. So God tells Moshe, make two trumpets you know, made out of silver. And they are for gathering the Eda and for traveling. Remember two things, gathering, assembly, and for traveling. The tkiah, I'll just I'm just hiding the words. You can look at them later on. When you blow one tkiah, that's a sign for senior staff that come and gather. So all the you know, all the political leaders gather together, like in camp. You know, it's called Sevet Bakir or senior staff gathers together. Okay. Um, so therefore, if you blow one, one tkiah. Remember, kia is a DC, like a flat sound, and a trua is an oscillating sound, up and down. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. We argue that what frequency is a frequency of three, ashfarim, or frequency of nine, but basically, a kia is DC, it's like direct current, like a flat line, and, um, and a trua is an AC, the alternating. Now, um, if you blow a trua, then it's time to travel. So basically, if you blow twice, the whole nation gathers together. If you blow once, only the leaders come. But if you blow a trua, it's time to travel. And when you blow the second trua, all all the camps go. And we go. We blow trua, and every camp goes in order of their camping chapters of. And we gather the nation together, they would blow and we'd have a Torah. They would, they blow Kia, not a Kia, so people wouldn't get scared. For some reason, Bnei Aron, they don't have enough shops to do. They're blowing the Chassad's throat. And now comes our big Sukim. That's all background. Now we have to start to focus. Now, parent, um, tangentially and parenthetically, Chumash introduces a law for all generations. First, I'm going to read the Pasuk the way it seems to imply. Should war be imminent in your land? Wherever the enemy might be. So it's, war is imminent, your state of war, things are bad. What are we commanded to do? You're supposed to blow a trua, an oscillating sound, with these with these trumpets. And then if you blow the shofar, you'll be remembered by God, in front of God, and he'll save you from your enemies. Now, when you read this by itself, it sounds like voodoo, right? It sounds like something totally un-Jewish. What's it mean? If you're in trouble, you have a magic trick. What's the magic trick? Almost the way people misunderstand God's attributes of mercy. Say these magic words and God will forgive you. But it's not saying them, it's understanding them and applying them and living that way. Now, should war be imminent? Okay? What are we supposed to do? I'll just take the simple reading. What does Amisro need to do when war is imminent? All we need to do, go to our temple, blow these trumpets, God may, might have been sleeping, and now God will oh, wake up from these trumpets. He'll remember you and will come and save you from your enemy. Like, you know, somebody have some secret weapon. There's no way Chazal would accept that type of shot interpretation, and we're going to see what they base it on. Chazal put a lot of footnotes when they read this passage. What's the assumption? Assumption number one, should war be imminent in your land for whatever the trouble might be? Assumption number one, War is imminent because you've done something wrong. The basic assumption of Chumash is wars don't happen by chance. If the Jewish people are in a state of war, we've done something wrong. God is sending the enemy as a wake-up call. Says read Yishayahu Hoy Ashur Shevet Api. Somebody's sending Ashur after giving us all those warnings and we don't listen. Yemiyahu, God sent the Babylonians. Remember, Nefagadnetzar is Eved Hashem. And God might send later Korish to bring us redemption and he'll send Nefagadnetzar to destroy us. But International events, political events, military events are all under the control of God. And if things are bad, again, on the national level, that's a sign from God, we better do tshuva. Therefore, because we're to blame for the trouble, if we want the trouble to stop, what do we need to do? We need to blow shofar not to wake God up, 
God's he no lo yisham below. God doesn't sleep. God's always aware. We have to wake ourselves up. That's assumption number two. Blowing shofar is not to wake God up, but to wake ourselves up. So we blow a shofar as a wake-up call to ourselves, and we have to remember that what? That God judges us for our deeds. Assumption number three, when we remember that we're being judged by God for our deeds, and we must have done something wrong, that means we have to hear a rabbi's speech, and we do tshuva. And if we do tshuva, assumption number three, then God will save us from our enemies. Okay? Three assumptions, which don't seem to be at all shot of the pasuk. Assumption number one, if there's trouble, we are to blame. God is behind the trouble. He's sending it. We have to blow shofar to wake ourselves up, to wake up our hearts, to repent, to, um, to introspect, ask what we're doing wrong. We have to remember that we're being judged for our deeds, and therefore we have to remember to do, take upon ourselves to fix our ways. Again, first we have to know what we're doing wrong. We have to fix our ways. And if we do that, God promises to help us from our enemies and save us. Those are the three assumptions we have to see. They're not written here. Now, in addition to that, then we have the Pasuk, even when you're not in trouble, on your holidays, on the, uh, you know, on your happy days, on Rosh Chodesh, we blow it kia in the shofar. And that's also a zikaron. Later, I'm going to talk about what this Pasuk is doing here. What's the juxtaposition yeah, between Pasuk Tet and Yil? Okay, we'll put those two together later on. Now, um, so what's the other line question I want to talk about? Okay. Um, is we're here communicating our feelings so together. What are you doing? I'm yeah, just going to make the bed. Let me just do it. You know, I, let me mute everybody real fast. Why are you so independent? Oh, there we go. How do I meet everybody? I thought I could meet everybody. I can meet me. You have to come off. Okay. Um, I should be, wait a second, I should be host. I should be able to mute. It's gone. Okay, I'm host. I want to mute. Oh, mute all. Here we go. There we go. Okay, we'll pick up again. Sorry about that. Um, um, other, okay, so what's my underlying question again? This understanding that what? That when you hear a shofar blowing, it's going to cause tshuva. In other words, the way the rabbis understand this pasik, pasik tet, is exactly Rosh Hashanah. Our lives are on the line. We blow shofar not to remember, you know, do some trick for God, but rather we blow shofar to remember that we've been judged for our deeds, and God will give us a good judgment if we do proper tshuva. There's no doubt that that's, that's exactly not Rosh Hashanah davening, it's Rosh Hashanah halacha. You know, that's why we have slichot beforehand, and that's part of our davening. And therefore, um, there's the theme of Rosh Hashanah we learn from Pasuk Tet, but only because of those three assumptions. I have to prove to you where these three assumptions are coming from. We'll get that from Sefer Melachim in a minute. Now, before, before, in case I forget, the verse that Ramban ho, ho, learns that we're obligated to pray the Alraita is from here. Notice, our biblical obligation to pray when we're in trouble, it's called Be'it Sarah, the, the anchor of Ramban's approach is exactly this verse, Pasuk Tet, what we just saw, this verse over here. Which is interesting because if there's a biblical obligation, it should be explicit. It doesn't say here, thou shalt daven. It sounds something totally different. It says, when you're in trouble, blow a shofar and God will help you. It sounds like a some type of crazy kind of promise, a magical kind of promise. And the rabbis learn from here, Ramban for sure, that our biblical obligation to pray is based on this. So the goal of the share today, I've been beating around the bush too long. Now I'm going to get to the main part of the share. I want to show you where these assumptions are coming from and how it relates to Devarim, because one of the biggest themes in Devarim, I'm sure you remember, is is establishing one central place where God's name and reputation will be known. And that's the place called the Beit HaMikdash later. It's going to be set in Yerushalayim. And that's what Shlomo Melech is going to build. Remember, Shlomo Melech finally fulfills this. David wants to fulfill it. David gets it started. He gets the ball rolling. Shlomo, his son, is able to dedicate the temple early in his reign. When Shlomo Melech dedicates the temple, he's going to offer a prayer. And all the assumptions we just talked about are explicit in Shlomo's prayer. And that's what I want to show you. So here. So I want to show you that Chazal's understanding that Zikaron is we have to, it's a wake-up call to us. We have to remember we're being judged and we have to repent. And there's a reason why things are bad. Every, all these three assumptions we made in Pasuk Tet, or we're going to see them explicitly in Shlomo's prayer. And Shlomo's prayer relates to the temple and the idea of prayer in the temple. Now, so I'm skipping the first 26 Psukim of chapter 8, but in, in chapter 8, 
it's we're dedicating the temple. It's, we finished building in chapter six and seven of Malachim Aleph in one kings. It's built. Shlomo gathers the nation together in Yerachitanim and gathers the nation together. First, thanks God profusely, saying, you know, and thanking him for keeping his promise to King David. And then he gives a big philosophical statement. Is it possible that God is, could be on land? Remember? That was Hashemayim Bishmei Hashemayim. We have Shabbos Minerus is built on that line. Hashemayim Bishmei Hashemayim. The heavens can't include all of God. And for sure not this house. There's no way that this house is big enough or great enough that God could be here. But rather, we need something down here on earth that reminds us of our connection to God. Okay. Now, now he has a prayer about prayer. This is what he says. Ufanita utfilat abdecha. Shlomo is praying that God should turn and listen. Remember, remember the idea of the Shmoa Kol Shofar and the Shmoa Tfila? The idea of Shomea Tfila, I want to develop from here, but in a much deeper sense of what Tfila about Zikaron. Shlomo is asking God, turn to the prayers of your servant and his supplication. If you remember from almost a week ago, last Mitzvah Shabbos, we started Slichot Ashkenazim. And the Piyot, the Pizmon, the third one, which is the one that's a refrain. Remember, Mitzvah Menucha Cheinu Panecha? Okay. And what's the refrain? Mishmo El Rina Valatfila. If you have a show that has a choir or a chazanot, it's a big um, choir piece all the time. Mishmo El Rina Valatfila. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Shlomo here um, is going to coin that phrase and saying, the purpose of the Mikdash is a place where we can turn to God in prayer, and God will listen to our prayers. Remember the ideas of eyes being open. We'll see that soon in Sefer Bamidbar. Day and night. Remember, Hashem. We finally hit Sefer Tvarim. That should be obvious, right? That's clear, okay? No, Shlomo is praying that God should, in this place, should be a place that God will hear our tefillah. The question is, why is God only hearing prayer here? Why not everywhere? What's this idea of this national center? Why is tefillah primarily here? That's what you have to explain. Now, now comes the big jump. Here again, makom. What did Shlomo just add? The Shamata Vesalachta. What is that? It was enough to not just to hear. What does it mean to hear and to forgive? For some reason, it's going to repeat itself. So I'm going to highlight it. Over and over again, Shlomo is saying when we pray to God, we want him to hear our prayers and forgive us. What's that imply? If what the essence of prayer is not asking God to save us from battle, right? The essence of prayer is asking God to forgive us and accept our repentance. Now, let me let me give it an analogy. Let me stop this here for a minute, so you don't read ahead. Um, I want to give an example. The way things are usually understood, let's say there's a famine or a drought or an epidemic, whatever it might be. The assumption is that's nature, but you know maybe you, we believe that God made nature. He's behind it. But there's randomness in nature. And you know, sometimes like we have this terrible custom of wishing people mazel tov, right? Which is a disaster thematically. Why? Because nothing's by chance. We should have good, you know, good luck. If you assume that everything is random, so I believe that God made it, but it's like rolling dice, and I want to make sure that I get a good set of cards, it doesn't make sense. You know, Chumash goes totally against that. Of course, when we say mazel tov, we, re we, re we really don't mean that. We're just saying, we're really saying brachot. But I want to get, I want to get into the, my Rebbe of Riel Benun goes, will never say Maso Tov, you know, as in principle. It was to say brachot or something like that. He's a, he has all fight against it. But, but you can't break, when there's a minute in Amisar, you don't, you can't go, you just have to reinterpret it, understand it with uh, Midat Rahamin. Now, let me explain what I mean. The classic assumption is something's going wrong and, you know, we got hurt by chance. We had bad muscle. But what can we do because we're God's people? We can turn to God and we have protexia. God who made nature can get intervene. He can talk to Mother Nature, who's ever in charge of this trouble. And God can intervene with nature and save us. Meaning, 
we believe in God, we believe that he's powerful, but we don't connect the punishment or the trouble to our, our deeds. You follow? When you connect the trouble to chance, the Rambam talks about that in, in Hot Shuvah, that um, you know, when people take trouble happening and they relate it to chance, he says, that's a midah zarit. It's a, it's a, that's, when something bad's happening, in fact, he quotes the psukim we just read from, you know, in Sefer Bamidbar, that means we're doing something wrong. Therefore, the assumption of chumash, we can prove it all the way through. Again, we're talking about on a national level, on a group level, not on the individual. That's a different story. On the national level, when something goes wrong, the assumption is we're, we, as a people, are doing something wrong. And that's why God's sending a drought. We, as we say it in Shema every day. We say every tochacha. Remember all the tochacha in Vayikra, in um, Devarim, besides the ones in Bechukotai? All through Shema, Vayim Shema. Remember the second parashat of Kriya Shema, parashat Echev, everywhere you turn. The tochach, the brocha and klolot and harival. Shirat Azinu coming up. Over and over again, Chumash says, if you don't follow my laws, I'm going to have to punish you. You follow my laws properly, I'm going to reward you. Things will go good. There won't be trouble. Same thing in Shmot over and over again. And therefore, the key assumption is if something is going wrong to us as a nation, we're to blame. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to remember when something goes wrong that we're to blame. If we want God to intervene and help us, we have to remember that God sent it, God's behind this trouble. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? And once we understand what we're doing wrong, we have to repent. We have to show remorse, admit what, you know, try to understand and promise to do better. And then we ask God, accept our repentance, accept our tshuva. And, and based on that, even though we have finished, you know, as long as we've showed our will or desire to do better, we want God to forgive us already and take away the punishment before it happens. That's, that's, we'll see that explicitly in Shlomo's tefillah. Now, that zikaron is zikronot. That's not remembering that God exists, not the remembering that he can forgive you, whatever it may be, remembering that what happens to us as a nation is a function of our deeds. Now, why is that important? What's the connection to the temple? The biggest problem is, what are we doing wrong? How do you know what's wrong? It's, let's say I know God's ha not happy with me, but I think I'm fine. What am I doing wrong? Read the classic Navim, read Yishayel. <laughs> He's screaming. Is it? Read Yemriel. Remember, the people were saying we're fine, and Yemriel says, no, you're not fine. Same thing, Yishayel. The, the job of the Navi or the job of the Levim in the temple. Read the Shir Shoyom. In the temple, when they brought Korbanot, remember the Mishnah in, in Masechet Tamid, when they talk about this temple service, when, the, when they brought Korbanot, as they brought Korbanot, they blew Shofar, and the Levim, as they blew Shofar and brought on the Korbanot, the Levim opened up with Shir, with their songs, with their psalms. That's the Shir Shoyom we sing. Except for Friday when we're too busy to do Tshuva, everyone is about repentance and introspection and fixing your ways. And the ones we don't say, they're all about, I mean, half of Tilim are those ideas of tshuva and how to behave better and praying to God that, you know, it's asking God to accept our, our repentance. But why do we need this central place of worship? It's not a place with these magic powers that God forgives us. I need to gather as a nation to hear the rabbi's speech. And that's, that's in my opinion, that's the key concept of going to shul. Remember people say, Usually that's the most boring part of davening. But the main reason we gather is to hear the Torah reading. So we pray as well then when we're there. But we hear the Torah and we have guidance. Someone wants to do good, but what's the right thing to do? Then we have that, That's our biggest problem all the time. We want to do good, but what is the right thing to do? So that requires discussion, even healthy arguments. And therefore, as a people, if we strive to do good, we have good guidance and we go to the Kohanim and Levim and the elders, Skenim, and we gather together, they'll give us guidance, what should we be doing? Now, we want examples of things that in the time of the, and when we had prophets, just read the books of prophecy and they'll give you very good insights of the things that get, make God really angry. It was what brought the temples down and why was God angry? And that's simply, that's a class in the Vimah and later prophets. But you get a pretty good idea of the main things that God um, is looking at when we talk about us, our behavior on a national level. So with that in mind, I want to show this to you in Shlomo's Tefillah. Watch what happens next. Let's go back now to our source sheet from Shlomo. Follow Shlomo Vesalachta, okay? When a person sins, to it's either, and he'll go in front of the Mizbech. You know, we want you to hear and do Mishpat, do. We want God to do justice, that the one who does evil should be punished, and the one who is righteous should get his reward. Now, that's again more on a 
no, on an individual level. Now comes the national side. Listen carefully. That's war. That's kita bom mechamad barzchem, isn't it? Asher yachtulach. What's this? Asher yachtulach. Remember assumption number one. Remember kita bom mechamad barzchem. I said, what's the assumption? The reason why there's war because we've sinned. It's right here explicitly. When you go to war, if we're losing in battle because we've sinned, what do we need to do? We have to do. We have to repent. V'shabu elacha. We'll do a We have to recognize your name. Your name. This is a place where God's name is known. Your reputation. We have to ask a do proper tshuva, and then we pray through this house, and then vata tishma shemaim v'salachta. Here we go again. Tishma shemaim v'salachta. Not this tishma. We don't God hear our prayer and take away our enemy. Hear our prayer and forgive us and accept our repentance. And then return us back to our land if we're losing in battle. The same thing. From Shmana, why? If there's a drought, it's because we've sinned. It's what we say in Shmana every day, but Shlomo's saying it explicitly. We daven at this place, this Mokom again. We recognize your name. Remember, right? And therefore, it's a place to repent, to ask yourselves, what are we doing wrong? Chatat doesn't always mean mezid, it can mean shogeg. Sometimes you want to do the right thing, but you do the wrong thing. You know, sometimes you have good intentions, but you do the wrong thing. Half of our troubles usually things like that. That's why we need to gather. People don't have the ability to figure that out on their own. That's why there's a need to gather in a national center. And that's the importance of a mikdash. That's the importance of gathering. Otherwise, we have 150 religions and, and all kinds of charlatans come up with all different ideas of you know, getting people, taking advantage of that and promising people things that aren't really true. So we need the central place of worship where there's proper guidance for na- our national behavior. And here we go again. Yes. You have to hear from heaven and forgive us that the sins of your nation. And you'll guide them. You instruct them. Remember the word Torah? You'll guide them in the proper way, which they should walk. Remember, And then you'll give them rain at the right time for your nation. That was assumption number two, right? That when we gather together, it's God's to blame. Beneath Kartan, we have to remember that we're to blame and we have to do, re- repent. Now, the idea of a Shemat of a Salach, I want to bring a proof from Shemun Esrei. If you don't know what you did wrong, you can't do Tshuva. Therefore, the first blessing we make in Shemun Esrei is, is knowledge, isn't it? I need to understand what I did wrong. And without understanding, I won't be able to do tshuva. Therefore, the first thing we ask for, give us the ability to understand between good and bad. It comes right out of Gan Eden, remember? Now, so now we understand what I did wrong. I have to want to do tshuva. That's the next blessing. Remember? We have to recognize that God wants us to repent and he's willing to accept our repentance. We're living in a world of tikkun. And then we ask him, accept our repentance. That's for Salah. That's Salah Lanu. So the first three brachot of Shemun Esrei are exactly this idea. And that's why we begin with Chonein Dat, because if you don't know what you did wrong, you can't do tshuva. Now, the same thing. Should there be a famine in the land? Rav Kiev Baaretz, or Dever, uh, epidemic, or, or whatever kind of plague there is. Shidafon, all these different agricultural things. Locusts coming, eating up our crops. Okay? Any type of punishment, plague. And he prayer, what the person have to do? They have to know each negalavavo. They have to know what they've done wrong in their heart. Go open up his hands in prayer, but it's prayer not help me out. It's prayer accept my repentance. Now, how do you prove to God you're sincere? You have to be sincere. But God is begging sincerity and a true desire to do the right thing. Now, it could be sometimes you don't know what you did wrong, or you misunderstood what you did wrong. So you pray to God that he gives you, he, you pray to God that he instructs you in the right way, or that your rabbis instruct you the right way. And therefore, he says, Listen, see, every time, everyone gets what they deserve, because God knows our hearts. You know who's sincere, who's not sincere. So they should fear you all the days that they're on the land. Okay. So now just to review, I, I put one against the other. 
Remember our three assumptions? This was our Pasuk in Bamidbar over here. Let me get my annotator. See if we're working today. And we have a draw and an arrow. Okay. So, that's been a gave am chay Yisrael difnei oyev, right? Assumption number one, asher yachtulach. That was our big assumption. That was the reason. Okay. Barot and bachatzotzrot. Does it mean we don't blow shofar for God to remember to wake up, but rather, bitpalu bitchanu elecha. Okay. And therefore, what's in front of God, we ask want God to forgive us for our ways. And then, and then God will bring us back to our land. That's when Hashatem Avechem will save us from battle. So the three, the three assumptions that we made reading this Pasuk are exactly explicit in Shomos Fila. I think that's the source that's, that enables Ramban okay, to use this Pasuk as our Chiv of Tfila. Because what can I assume from here? The, it's, you know, Shlomo is one of the brightest people ever, as, as, a, as the Psukim tell us. And there's no doubt that's how Shlomo understood these Psukim and Sefer Devarim. And therefore, that's going to be our return. And now I have to stop my share, clear the drawings, and go back to my mouse. Okay. Now, now comes the next Pasuk, which helps us understand our holidays better. That's when wars the minute. What's next? Uvyom simchatchem mo'adechem roshechot shechem. Not only when you're in war do you blow shofar, but even when you're not at war, on your holidays, you're supposed to blow shofar. Not a true, but here at Kia, that's the, that was the mitzvah in the Mikdash, they did this all the time, on our sacrifices. And there'll be a zikaron in front of God. God will remember, or we have to remember, God remembers and judges us. And, and, and Am Hashem, your boss. Remember? Now, in case you didn't know, this is a different shir. This explains the Allah Yavah, doesn't it? When do we say Allah Yavah? On our holidays and Rosh Chodesh, right? On Yom Tov, Yom Im Noraim, and Rosh Chodesh, that's when we say Yalav Yavo. Now, um, so let me use a, first let me just show you what's going up. The assumption is we're being judged on the holidays. If it's a Yom Zikaron, those, if all these holidays we're blowing shofar and there's Zikaron, right? Uh, where's it say Zikaron? Um, if these holidays, Rosh Chodesh, is the time of Zikaron, that means we're being judged. So because we're being judged, what do we pray to God? That when you're judging us, take into consideration not only our deeds, but look what everyone's doing, right? What should come before you when the judge makes his decision? We call them the character witnesses. Take into consideration, remember three different forms of God seeing and, and accepting prayer, bishma, bipaked, bisachera, all different, seven different ways of describing God listening, okay? Our, our actions, what we've done, and what our parents did, our grandparents, our forefathers, we have this concept of Mashiach, which we have a goal as a nation of, of returning and building a, a just nation. We dedicated a city to you, we a whole nation in your honor. But look at the we're asking God, look at the bigger picture, and in light of that, give us a good judgment. Members of Christian Botaba, the assumptions were being judged on the holidays. Now I need to explain why we're being judged on these holidays. So I'm going to give you an analogy. I have two analogies to use of these two psukim. Remember the next door neighbors. One is, should war be imminent? The other is, um, uh, on your holidays. So I call this, I want to I want to use an analogy I call, um, let me stop the share for a minute. I want to call it preventive medicine. So everyone here has been to a dentist, I'm sure. I think I've used this before, but I'll just use it again. Anytime you have a toothache, you go to the dentist, right? You can always go to the dentist for a toothache. You know, first they'll say, your, first, who, who did your dental work? And say, complain about the original dentist, and then he'll fix you up, and he'll give you a bargain, he'll give you 30% off, and he'll fix you. And if you want a really nice, anyway, the whole thing is, you can always, when a toothache, you can always go to the dentist, any day of the year. But even when you don't have a toothache, what do you do? You come for a routine checkup. And if you come to a routine checkup, there's less chance you'll need to come for a root canal. Agreed? Therefore, what's my claim? Plastic tet should war be a minute? That's the toothache. Let me go back to my. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. Um, we want to share a screen. Pasik tet. Where are we here? Um, sure, see, here we go. This pasik. This is a. This is our toothache. Should war be a minute? Is our toothache any day of the year? And even when we're not in trouble, this is our routine checkup. What's my claim? We have a monthly checkup. In fact, what's Rosh Hashanah? Is a super duper Rosh Chodesh. That's a question. Remember, Rosh Hashanah Rosh Hashan is Rosh Chodesh. We say so in davening. People don't realize it. We didn't do Shabbos of Avarchim for um, more Kabbalistic reasons. We don't do 
We did, we did, we did Bet Chodesh. But it's Rosh Chodesh. We bring the Korbanot of Rosh Chodesh in the Beit HaMikdash. And it is Rosh Chodesh, but it's a super duper Rosh Chodesh. And therefore, on Rosh Chodesh is a monthly quiz, a monthly checkup. So that instead of having a final once a year, half our grade is our final, half our grade is our monthly quiz. It's Rosh Chodesh. Right? And we have our seasonal checkups, which are the Moadim. Now, why do we have those? Why, why are these days of Zikaron? Why are the holidays? Why are the Moadim times of Zikaron? This will take us now to Rosh Hashanah. Um, remind me to do the mRNA analogy in a minute. I want to lose track. I have an idea here. I'm not sure if it's right. I want to go to the mission Rosh Hashanah that says what I'm just saying. We are judged four times a year. Remember the second mission in the second Rosh Hashanah, first there. Okay? Four times a year we're judged. We're judged on our grain Pesach time in the spring. This is the land of Israel. It's our agriculture. Okay? Shavuos time, we're judged for the fruit, the fruits coming from the trees of the, of the five of the seven species. Rosh Hashanah, everyone's judged. That's the famous line. And on Chag, on um, Sukkot, we're judged for water. Now, what's going on? Who's really judging us here? Nature, isn't it? Our lives are dependent on grain. Remember, we domesticated wheat, we're hooked on grain. We need grain to survive. Grain only grows in Israel two months a year. Remember, from April, April through uh, mid-June. And if that grain fails, we have to go to Egypt for help or we'll have a famine. We're worried stiff, but what's Chumash tell us? The outcome of our grain and our harvest is a function of our deeds. Therefore, at the beginning of the spring, as soon as Rebbe Aviv, as soon as the spring begins, we dedicate a week to remembering that the outcome of a grain harvest is a function of our deeds. And we're being judged, not by nature, but by God who's in charge of nature. Our fruit harvest can get ruined in the summer. Again, insects can come, heat waves, lots of things could happen. It could rain, sometimes rain is bad in the middle of the summer. And therefore, the outcome of our fruit harvest, which we can store all year long as well, we can dry out our grape. I mean, we can make wine, we can make olive oil, we can dry the dates and the figs. That's going to keep us fed all year long. Its outcome is, a function. therefore, we're worried about that. Shua's time. And Sukkot's time, we're worried about water. Got it? No. What you need, though, and like, that's like, remember, once a year, you have to remember, every day you have to remember the Exodus, but once a year, you have to remember, we make a big deal about it. I think I gave you a Mother's Day analogy. Even though every day is Mother's Day, you have to celebrate once a year. To, we make Mother's Day once a year, remember, every day is Mother's Day. Every day is a Rosh Hashanah. Every day, God is Melech, Melech called Olam. Once a year, I go crazy about the idea. I recharge my batteries. So I need once a year, what this specific day is irrelevant for now. Once a year, I need to recharge this concept of Machiot. Once you have to remember that God's king. But in the land of Israel, if I want to pick a good time of year to recharge, so I could do the anniversary of creation, but that's a machloka when creation was. The best time to recharge is when, in, again, in an agricultural society, everyone's assuming that our lives are on the line because of the upcoming rains. If it doesn't rain in Cheshvan, in basically October, November, December, we're finished. If you don't miss Echet Tanit, it's all there. If it doesn't rain in Cheshvan, Kislev, we daven Rosh Hashanah davening. Malchiyot, Zichonot, Shofrot, the whole thing. We take, we have outdoor minions, the whole thing. And we have fast days. We have, um, that's all Mesechet meaning humans think, regular person would think, that we're being judged. The rainy season judges the outcome of the whole year because it's going to fill up the aquifer. We need that water. The water we drink in the summer is based on the rains in the winter because our wells won't have any water if it doesn't rain in the winter. Therefore, in nature, we're being judged once a year anyhow by, by our climate, by the early rains. And to make sure we're worthy of those rains, which is the second part of Kriyat Shema, again from Sefer Dvarim, since we're being judged those times of years, therefore that's the best time to, to make a, uh, that's the best, if I'm, if I'm going to recharge once a year, this theme of God's judging us, we're being judged by God, it's a super duper Rosh Chodesh. That's the idea. That's we're having. It's called, and Rosh Hashanah really means the beginning of the agricultural year. It's the seventh month, but it's the beginning of the agricultural year. I could bring the psukim from maybe real quick. I didn't want to do this, but I think I have it open here anyhow. Devarim in chapter ten in Devarim right before Vayim Shemoa. Um, here in chapter eleven in Devarim, remember Pasig Vayim Shemoa Tishma Mitzvotai. 
right before, and it says the land Moshe tells the people, the land you're going to is not like Egypt, where you had the Nile River and irrigation ditches. Um, it said the land you're going to is hills and valleys. You get water from rain, not from rivers. God looks after this land. God's eyes, but Ein is also a Mayan, a source of water. So God's source of water is God's eyes, and it's Hashkach, it's Pratis, it's beautiful wordplay. That's that concept of Rosh Hashanah comes from here. From the beginning of the rainy season to the end of the year. And God, remember, the idea that Shlomo said, was, God looks over us, gives us rain, and therefore, without these tzukim, you can't understand Vayim Shema, that we say every day. If you listen, then what? Then I'll give you rain at the right time, and you have animals, and you know, and things will go good. You'll, you'll prosper. If not, you'll lose it. Now, in light of that, I want to go back to this idea of, of zikronot now, and I'll use that little analogy. In essence, what's happening? What's zikaron? Zikaron is not remembering that God exists, remembering that God can't forgive you. It's remembering that we as a nation, as a group, are responsible for our deeds. And when things happen, when there's calamity, when there's tragedy, when there's threat, when there's trouble, we can fix things by fixing our ways. That's the essence of zikronot, which is based on, again, a machiot, you follow? And the way we do it is with shofrot. Now, how do you remember? With the shofar. Shofar is the tool. Now, here's my MRI. If I understand the, um, the, what do you call it? The, the chemistry behind it, whatever it's called, the way the mRNA vaccine works, it's not a vaccine. It enters your body, and it causes your body to vaccinate itself. Do I have it right? In other words, there's some, it's a catalyst that goes into your body. It's going to you know, start a process. And once the process starts, the body takes over on its own. It makes it, make, the body makes its own vaccine. The mRNA vaccine teaches the body how to make the vaccine. Even if it's not true, I think that's how I understood it. Now, let's say it is true. That's Kiat Shofar. Okay? The Shofar itself doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> the Shofar doesn't, yeah, the Shofar we have to hear. And that's a catalyst to get us to do proper chuva. You need to do something. You need, you need that catalyst. You have the ability to but you need to do something to spark that feeling I have to repent. And therefore, shofar blowing is the essence of tefillah. What is it? It's a spark for this transformative understanding that our faith is on our own hands and in the hands of God. But we're being judged for, by our deeds, not by our prayers. Our prayer, we have to pray. You have to re- pray to remember there's Prayer has to be transformative. Remember, all the things of our daunting, saying that all the time, our daily shvonesra we talked about before. Remember, asking for wisdom and, and for tshuva and then forgiveness. And then after that, we can ask for rafainu. We ask for, for health and we can ask for prosperity in, in brachalinu. And therefore, I, I see shofar blowing as a type of mRNA vaccine, meaning what? It enters your body, it enters your soul, your neshama. But once it's there, it gets your, it gets, you have the ability to create your own, to, to protect yourself by doing introspection, by doing proper tshuva. Shofar blowing is a catalyst that gets it started, which is the purpose of fainting is what, but, but all ritual does that idea. But shofar does it beautifully. So I want to use my mRNA va- um, analogy to appreciate this year to teach the idea of, of shofar blowing. It's super important, but the shofar, you have to blow shofar and it has to be inspiring. But if, if all you do is blow shofar and that's it, that's not going to do anything. Shofar has to come with education, with understanding. And that's why we have tefillah that comes with, you blow shofar during davening, you follow? That's why ikar tefillah shofar is during shmanesare. So we do it beforehand, like to be yotze. But it has to go with prayer and the psukim and everything with it and all the themes of davening, which we don't have time to see today. But when you, when, remember, everyone has an, like, aleinu, it's our duty, remember, to praise God. That's the beginning of Malchio. And that's the sochir tabri. The rest is all in davening. So what I want to end with, hope I get my point across about the uh, Sikhron. We'll take questions in a minute. I just want to go and, um, so you know, this we've seen many times. I think we talked about this last time at the Bahartanu. But I want to go to the Khatima of, of every Shmon Esrei on Rosh Hashanah, which is also the, you know, it's from Achyot, but it's every, it's Mincha, Shachris, and, um, and, and, uh, and Marv as well. What are we asking God to do? We want God to become king. This is our prayer. This is what we're praying for. We want God's kingdom to be recognized. We want everyone to recognize God. Okay. Every living thing. That's the idea of universal understanding of Judaism, where we have a goal. 
not that everyone be Jewish, but everyone be good and understand that they're responsible to God, like the story of the flood. And every living person should say what? Hashem Elokei Yisrael Melech. What's that mean? Hashem, the God that the Jewish people are talking about. Not that we're right and they're wrong, but rather we, we make a name for God. We talk about our God, a God who demands justice and kindness you know, and wants a just society. The God that we're talking about and our understanding of God, not that we have the right theological understanding and they have something wrong or something, but rather our understanding of God, what God is and what he expects from men. We want other nations to recognize God's expectation. That's why you go back to Noah and Zikronot, the, the basic idea, the universal idea of being good. And God expects everyone to be good. Again, you can argue what good is, but the idea that man's responsible for its deeds, its society is responsible for one another. And God is, expects that. And God can bring trouble on all nations for the bad behavior. The God, if we do a good job serving God, and if we serve God and he rewards us for good behavior and even punishes, we said that in last week's Parsha, and even by punishes for our bad behavior, through that other nations will see this concept of God. And then our prayers and our actions and how God treats us will cause everyone hopefully to be better. How, how, how it will take place okay? um, and his kingdom is everywhere. That's the universal idea. Therefore, it happens by our keeping his mitzvot. Make, separate us, make us special by keeping our mitzvot. Our portion should be keeping your Torah. And therefore, we keep our Torah, Sabini Mitabecha, reward us with your goodness. That's prosperity if we're doing a good job. Make us happy with it. That's winning wars. Sabini Mitabecha is prosperity. Okay. That's winning battles. That was the passage we saw in Kitabom Mechamar Zachem. And here's our biggest prayer. Um, which we, we know we serve God, we want to do it in a pure way. Which we, want, we want not to be phony. It was, help us serve God with a pure heart and not to be phony, but to, to be truthful in our service of God, which isn't easy. Okay? And then because what you're a God of truth and you expect truth and your words are truth, and then we recognize that God is king over everyone. He separated Amisar with this job to do and set aside once a year this Yom Karon to remember not that he exists, but he judges us for our deeds. And not only that we remember that we're being judged, we have an international resp universal responsibility to the international community by being God's model nation. And therefore, if we remember that and show God we care about that, then that gives God reasons to accept our prayers and give us a good judgment for the year. All right, so that was my, um, that's why I want to take the themes we saw. Maybe the theme of Amakom Shev Har Hashem, which nowadays becomes the shul. The idea, shul, the idea of reward and punishment. Uh, help us to understand the idea of Machil and Zichronot uh, together with Shofrot in our Rosh Hashanah Davne. So we'll stop here on overtime. I'll take I'll check the chat and I'll take questions. You know, Rabbi Jay had to go to the airport. Um, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned Mazel Tov. I'm sorry. Um, I'll ask Jennifer's question. Um, Mazel means um, uh, Mazel means good luck, right? So when you say good luck, what's the assumption we say you should have good luck? That things are decided by luck, by Mazel. But Chumash is screaming, things don't happen by chance. Things happen. You know, we say every day in Shema that there's cause and there's cause for reward and punishment. So if there's a drought, if there's trouble, or if there's goodness, it's because of our deeds, or good deeds or bad deeds. That's not mazel, that's what you deserve. So wishing that you have good mazel thematically doesn't work with Chumash. That's why I'm being I'm being malamit schutanami. So saying when we say mazel, that we really don't mean it. We're just saying congratulations, kind of idea. But again, that's a whole different discussion, um, which I want to get into. Now, um, let me see the other question. Um, okay, that was the thing, Mazel. Um, not prayer, mostly here at the center, rather sacrifice the community nation. Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Let me go back to the beginning. Um, I, why do we, we do, blow, by, uh, for Miriam now, why don't we blow shofar on, in the temple, we did blow shofar on the holidays. Why we don't do it in shul? That's a whole, um, I guess just keep, in general, shul came later. So what mean? What we do in shul relates to the temple. What we do in shul, what we don't do in shul based on the temple, that has to do with tradition. Um, okay. Uh, how do chatzot and shofar differ? That's a whole, the difference in chatzot and shofar, there's a whole sugi and the gemara about that. That chatzot means shofar. But it's the same, it's, the difference, real simple is, at the natural level, you can make a bugle out of silver. At the home level, you can afford a shofar. You follow? The main thing, it's, it's not the animal, because we use an io to remember the akeda and things like that. Those are mystical reasons. But the main idea is a wake-up call. And it was just, it's a call that reminds you of war and your life is on the line. 
and you want to create that atmosphere when you daven. Um, how, how they did that, there's also again the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah that talks about that. Um, not prayer mostly here at the center, rather sac. Oh, so the temple has sacrifices, but my, so my claim is that's the beauty. Shlomo Melech is dedicating the temple, and he talks about prayer, not about sacrifice. He brings thousands of sacrifices, but he's, and his prayers I, is highlighting it's not about sacrifice. Sacrifice is a tool, it's a ritual that gets your mind moving. But the main thing is not just prayer, but but transformative prayer that changes your behavior, which is, I think that's why, that's why Shomu's tefillah is so critical in understanding tefillah. And that's why the, the Rambam, Ramban, uses that pasuk to learn davening from. Okay, I didn't have time to do the, the Rambam and how the Rambam and Rambam degree. Maybe next week we'll see it real quick. Um, okay, we did Mazel Tov. Okay. Uh, okay. So we get everyone's basically saying Shona, Shona Tova. Okay. Uh, okay. And I guess I'll, everyone, okay, the rest, those are easy questions. So um, I can't wish everyone Mazel Tov. <laughs> that would be good. I wish everyone a Chtiva B'Chtevi Tova and a deserving one. And then hopefully um, next year we can um, be deserving of uh, being able to dive in a show together, normal. And, uh, and return to some level of normalcy. All right, so Shana Tavan and Chiyah B'chatimah Tova, everybody. And we want to thank that last year, I want to thank Rabbi Jay's not here. So on behalf of all the teachers and on behalf of all the participants, I guess, I want to thank for his hard work. He's like, you know, he's used uh, Corona as a jumping stone to teaching Torah and Baruch Hashem. You yeah, have tons of ranges of shiurim and he deserves a big uh, yashar koach. Not a fundraising. Fundraising. That's the. Uh, that's like the mRNA. That's the idea. If you transform that into a, into your own decision, that God gave you. God blessed you with atachonim ladamdat. Already. We right, thank you so much and have a. Uh, as I say, we'll see you next year. Shana tova. Shana tova.